So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, broadcast and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media base, and baseball. I keep forgetting about that. And baseball, capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. If you want to see daily comic strips in their classic form, the place I'd steer you is Patrick McDonald's Mutts. Finely drawn, acerbic in voice, yet sweet by nature, gentle in image, yet often violent in humor, Mutz is a throwback to the earliest days of the art form, when a brick to the head meant, I love you, and the illustrations took more space than the words. And despite uh, appearing in more than 700 newspapers around the world, in 20 countries, Mutz is not the most widely recognized strip around, nor is its creator, Patrick McDonnell, the best-known artist. I suspect that's because he hasn't established himself as an Internet personality. I also suspect you'll learn shortly that he still doesn't use a computer. But Patrick has lent his name to the protection of animals, serving on the board of directors for the Humane Society of the United States and the Fund for Animals. He's also the author of two new books. The first, South, is a delightfully wordless children's story featuring Mooch from the Mutt Strip. The second is Mutt's Shelter Stories, a pastiche of selected Mutt strips and full-color, adorable photos of pets found in animal shelters, ready and waiting to be adopted by you or maybe me. Patrick, welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good, good. You know, I must say, though, (laughs) even though I don't use a computer, I've had a uh, Mutt's presence on MuttsComics.com for a really long time, one of the first cartoonists to actually have a website. Oh, my God. First thing out of my mouth, and I've already made you defensive. I'm, <laughs> I'm a bad host. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm, not, I'm not wrong about the Internet, am I? Oh, no, no. I, I, I don't even own a computer. But like I said, much, <laughs> much definitely has been on the, uh, the Internet for uh, a long time now. God, I think at least six years, I think. Well, all right. Since, since, uh, since you brought us around to this, this is not where I was going to start, but tell me about <laughs> Tell me about you and the stupid computer. Why, why the resistance to it? Um, I guess I'm a traditionalist. I mean, I think it has to do with my art, too. I mean, I'm still, you know, dipping a pen into a bottle of ink. So uh, <laughs> I think I like to keep my life simple. And, uh, you know, it's not that there's not computers in my, in my life. I mean, my, my wife used to work for IBM, so uh, she handles I'm, – I'm blessed. She handles all my emails and all that stuff. But uh, – you know, when you do a daily comic strip, time's important, and uh, that computer is definitely a time meter. So uh, I get to uh, I get to be lucky and get to uh, have a little bit of a simpler life. <laughs> so I have to ask because uh, you you and I have spoken before, uh, and I, so I, I kind of knew this, but um, I mean, there's no curiosity on your part. You don't sl- slip over, you know, to your wife's computer once in a while and say, "Hey, what's that? Show me uh, show me about this YouTube thing." Oh yeah, and it just confirms <laughs> my idea that uh, that can take up a lot of your life. So uh, you know, on occasion, it's fun to look at you know different sites or whatever. But I don't do it all that often. But I definitely see how uh, you can get hooked on that. Well, so continuing on that thread, though, let me ask you this: I mean, the the daily newspaper, sadly, uh, has kind of a, a tenuous future ahead of it, and. It seems to be taking strips with it. I mean, the papers all around us are shrinking. Um, and because you're not a big tech guy, I, I wonder, you know, how much thought you've given to, you know, the future of your, your strip and, and your characters and how that, that, that whole universe can be sustained in a world where, you know, we may not have as many newspapers in the future. Yeah, no, I'm aware of that. Um, well, like I said, I mean, I- I've had MuchComics.com, which has the strip on it now for a long time. So, I mean, the strip is on the Internet. And, um, you know, it's one of the reasons I've really enjoyed doing these children books, which to me is like a whole different outlet for Mutz. And I've been looking and talking about doing some kind of Mutz animation, so that might happen in the near Oh, you have? Yeah. Well, because, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and, and again, I don't, I don't mean to take anything away from MuchComics.com, and there we've probably given the name out five times now. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I mean, that's most of the, the creators I've talked to 
have indicated, I mean, it's great to have that exposure, but that's not the source of income. I mean, maybe for no. you know the books, but you're not going to you're not going to make your living by having a hundred thousand people go to your website and look at your comic for free. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, have you given uh, uh, have you given some thought to uh, other? You, you mentioned animation, and have you given other thoughts to other distribution? Or are you talking to your syndicate about stuff like this? You know, actually, another thing I just did was uh, I'm starting to do paintings, big paintings of the characters for uh, the Jack Gallery, and that's something I I used before I did Mutz, I used to paint quite a bit, so it's kind of been fun to go back to working on a bigger scale. So uh, between the children books, the paintings, and maybe doing animation, I, I think I'll be kept busy for a while. All right, and I, I think uh, now South is wonderful. I mean, it's a it's a very it's it's a it's a very simple story. Uh, it's perfect uh, kid story. And I know, let's see, this was the fifth book, right? It was the Gift of Nothing, yeah. just like Heaven, Art, and Hug Time. Um, are the children's books as, as challenging for you uh, as you know as the strip? I mean, the audience is different. I, I think. Uh, you know, I love doing the children books because, you know, when, I mean, I, I love doing the strip too, but, you know, when you do something every day for 14 years, I mean, you know, it's <laughs> you kind of work in the same panels and the same size with the same tools. And the children books really just give me an opportunity to, uh, you know, explore creatively different ways of handling the characters. So, uh, you know, for instance, I mean, South, the latest book, I went to a great show at the New York Public Library of uh, Japanese picture books from like the 18th century. Mm-hmm. And I was just really inspired. I, I felt the camaraderie with the uh, with the genre. I mean, it's very nature and really quiet and just beautiful books. And uh, so South was done with, uh, you know, an Asian brush and, you know, grind my own, own ink, you know, that, that style. And so, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that. It would be really tough to do that in the strip. I think it would uh, look a little too different. But, you know, the children books give me the opportunity to, uh, you know, not only explore different ways of art, but different ways of telling stories. You know, I mean, when you do a daily comic strip, it's you tell a whole story in three panels. So uh, it's kind of nice to have a few more pages to play with. Hmm. Um, so, uh, let me uh, let me just interrupt for a second, folks. Uh, if you want to get in on the uh, phone lines here, we'd love to have you call in. The uh, if you got a question or comment for Patrick McDonald, the uh, creator of uh, the Daily Comic Strip Mutts, the number is six four six five nine five three one three five. I will try to get to everyone's calls. Uh, I won't interrupt Patrick to get the call, but I will <laughs> I will get you on in just a moment. Um, could you foresee? Uh, uh, like working on a like a dual track uh, in terms of you know continuing the uh, the children's stories using the Mutz characters, but maybe having a, more like a graphic novel type of thing where the stories would appeal to your older readers and you know as well. Well, you know the the uh, children books you know obviously are being sold sold in the children's section of the uh, bookstore. Right. But I really do feel like they're for everybody. I mean they're they're simple stories, but I. Do feel like they're for adults. As a matter of fact, the first one, The Gift of Nothing, um, not this year, but next year, is going to be repackaged as a you know a gift book that'll you know be in for adults. So uh, I kind of feel like uh, they're for people of all ages as it is now. But uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned the graphic novel. I've been fooling around with a couple ideas, and somewhere in the future, I think I'll do a graphic novel. Part of the problem of attempting a graphic novel is uh, when you do a comic strip every day time <laughs> becomes very valuable and a graphic novel would definitely take a lot more time than a picture book got it well let's uh let's jump to the phone calls because I, I i know we've already got a caller here and i think this based on the web chat i think this is pastor pat are you there hello are you there hey hello yeah uh, yes oh good oh it's such a privilege to get to talk to patrick i'm such a fan of his work i have been a huge lover of comics and cartoons my whole life, and I wanted to call in and I wanted to ask Patrick something. I've noticed a very disturbing trend here of late. American animation and American cartoons are as strong a genre as anyone in the world. We do some of the finest work here. And now that American animation is dead, you know, there's no real cartoons being done in America. And then these computers, which which I don't like at all, I don't think you get the richness of color, 
the, 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 ask him if he feels that American, even cartoons, all of our animated film, does he feel that that's dying? You know, because I, I remember years ago there was a company called Filmation that did all their cartoons here in America, and they were spectacular. And now all that stuff is outsourced to Asian countries, and it's not near as good. There's, they, they can't imitate our style. They have their own unique, beautiful style, but they just can't do it like we do it. You know, like a superhero should be animated in America. Another thing I wanted to ask him, if he was to allow Mutz to be animated, would he insist that it be done in America? <laughs> uh, those are good questions. Um, you know, I'm not the biggest animation expert, but, uh, boy, I, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of Pixar films, which is, you know, done in California. Um, actually, I was just out there last week talking to a friend of mine who works there. Um, and uh, I think the Pixar films are great. Um, and uh, more than likely, uh, if I do do animation, I'm guessing it's going to be in the States. I, and I also think there's a lot of independent uh, animators from the United States that are really good. There's a, there's a guy named Paul Furlinger who I'm a big fan of, and I just think that's beautiful work. And he's right outside of Philadelphia. That's, well, see, that's what I was getting at. I know when Dr. Seuss passed away, his wife had, you know, so much say on his work. And I think, you know, if you do do that someday, you probably, you know, should say, hey, I'd like this done stateside. I'm not a huge fan of the computers, but they are growing on me. I like the light and color, and I like to see an artist's hand behind what's being done. I've always seen the artistry in cartoons. That's why I've always enjoyed it. And, you know, I, I'm, I, I paint and draw myself, but I, I love to hold the brush and smell the paint, or I like to ink my own drawings. You know, I, I fancied being a cartoonist myself years ago. But I just, I just feel like we really need to fight and protect the American look, because I think it's wonderful. You talked about the Asian look, and it is good. But I just, it just saddens me when I watch cartoons with my grandchildren, and they're so, you know, sushi Asian roll and all this. And I'm like, well, that's all well and good, but whatever happened to, you know, American style. I, I worry about it, especially in this economy. Right. Well, uh, uh, Pastor Pat, thank you very much oh, for no, calling it's in. It's a, priv it's a privilege to speak to him. I just love Mutz. They're like oh, family. You keep you up that. the good work, and, and I enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I want to go back to uh, something you were saying a minute ago, Patrick, about uh, that you had a couple ideas for uh, graphic novels. Would they would they involve the Mutz characters, or would, would you go outside of that world? Uh, one does and one doesn't, so um, I'm not sure, you know, eventually when I do it, which one I'm going to choose to do. <laughs> um, I want to tell folks uh, that are listening, uh, this is a very unusual. We haven't done this before, Mr. Media, but this is a special offer. If you're listening live right now to this interview with Patrick McDonald, if you're, if you're listening on the archive download, I'm sorry you're going to miss this, but the first five people to email their mailing address, their mailing address, you know, physical, old-fashioned mailing address, along with a comment about this interview with Patrick, send it to Marissa, M-A-R-I-S-S-A, -S -S underscore, Florindi, F-L-O-R-I-N-D-I, at DKC News, N-E-W-S, DKCnews.com, you will receive a free copy of Patrick's new book, Mutt's Shelter Stories. Now, the, the subject line in your email should be, I love Mutt's. Now, now Patrick didn't put, up, put that up. King Features is, is doing that, and we, oh, we appreciate that. And that's, that's news to me. That's really nice. Yeah, it was very nice. It's the first time we've done that, and uh, 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 I will, uh, while we're talking in a few minutes, I'll put the email address in the web chat, because I know it's a long one to, uh, <laughs> to write down. <laughs> But, uh, you know, first five people who uh, send your physical mailing address, along with a comment on this interview, to Marissa underscore Florendi at dkcnews.com, you'll get a free copy of Patrick's new book, Mutt's Shelter Stories. So, very nice. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, King Features. Um, this is, I think, your uh, 15th year producing Mutt's. Is that about right? Um, it started in 94, yeah, so next year will be the 15th. Was there ever a day that you wished you had landed on, you know, lizards or elephants or vultures <laughs> instead of instead of dogs? Um, no, you know, that's probably, you know, I tell up-and-coming cartoonists that that is the most important thing, that really pick something you know and love because you're stuck with it for a long time if, <laughs> if you're lucky. And, um, you know, I just, 
I love my dog and cat, and uh, you know they're a constant inspiration. So uh, I feel like I, you know, came up with characters that I'm really comfortable with. <laughs> and you know, now, it's flexible enough. I mean, you know, I, I've had, you know, different. You know, I have them go to Africa. I mean, I could add any animal I feel like adding to the strip, pretty much. That's funny you should you should say that. I wanted to ask you if there had been a character over the years that you've introduced to Mutz with high hopes that didn't work out and maybe it was never seen again. But I, you know, I mean, there's some I, I put up there. You know, I, I don't really, when I introduce a new character, I don't necessarily feel like, oh, this is someone who has to stick around. I mean, I guess it's sort of how I feel when I sit down and write and if a character pops in my head and I feel like he's worth doing, I'll do. So I don't really chart my characters that way. Yeah. So I don't have an answer for that. Well, I, I, I was thinking about it, and, you know, 14, 15 years, that's a long time. And, I, you know, uh, it'd be natural in anyone's business. Uh, characters would come, characters might go, but, um, you know, I just, I just got to wondering if maybe you'd, you know, maybe in 98 you thought, hey, you know, I got an idea for someone I'd like to add to the, uh, the ensemble, and yeah, maybe it just didn't uh, quite, you know, character doesn't quite work out. You know, the ensemble is pretty small. It really is Earl and Moody's yeah. world and, and their owners. And then, you know, through the years, they have, you know, I mean, there's, there's like, you know, Sh- Stinky put in Guard Dog and some characters appear a lot, but then there's, you know, others who just come and go and they might come again. <laughs> mm. All right. Um, uh, most cartoonists have horror stories of early rejections. Um, I know that you, you did a lot of, you did a lot of magazine work before Mutz. Uh, I think you did a strip for a parent's magazine for about 10 yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Did, did you, did you try and fail though to sell other strips before hitting pay dirt with Mutz? You know, I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> Mutz was my first strip that I, that I showed and got picked up and that's pretty unusual in the comic strip world. As a matter of fact, I have a funny story about that. I, uh, got to become friends with Chester Gould's daughter. Well, Chester Gould is uh, the guy who did Dick Tracy way back when. And uh, so I was at a dinner with her whole family, and obviously they knew the, the Chester Gould story, and the Chester Gould story is, uh, I think he, I think it's over 100. He, it's like 120 strips he tried before Dick Tracy got picked up. <laughs> So, wow. one of the first, so one of the first things they asked me at this dinner was like, ooh, how many strips did you do before Mutz got picked up? And I was really embarrassed to tell them that Mutz was the only strip I ever handed in. So, uh, yeah, no, Mutz, you know, I, I, you know, like you said, I mean, I got plenty of rejections when I was a magazine illustrator, a freelancer going to magazines. But um, and when I finally started getting magazine illustrations, I used to draw this little white dog. And the guy with a mustache and, you know, that eventually became much. So, um, you know, when I, when I did develop the strip, it kind of had a life in my illustrations over a period of 10 years too. It must kill your counterparts in the industry to hear you say that you sold the first strip. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I would, I would probably, uh, just start lying. Oh yeah, man. You know, that, well, only, that was, only one syndicate said yes. I mean, I did get rejected by all the other syndicates. All right. Well, that's, King that's, 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 say yes. it's, it's good to clarify because otherwise they'd be like, oh, yeah, man, that owl strip that I tried, man, that just was – nobody bought it, but I just thought the owl was so funny. Who, who's not going to love those eyes, you know? Um, <laughs> so um, – I kind of I kind of mentioned in the uh, introduction that uh, Mutz has a very classic look, and I I know that a lot of that has to do with the style in which you create it daily. Um, how did you settle on this style? I mean, I, to, to me, and I think other people, and I don't think you deny this. I mean, it goes back. It looks a, it, it, it's reminiscent of Crazy Cat in a lot of ways. How did you settle on this, and and you know how, how have you sustained it over the years? I mean, I think like all artists, you, I mean, you're always looking at stuff and you just absorb things and it sort of comes out. Um, and for me, you know, my earliest memory, one of my earliest memories as a kid was I was lucky enough where my mom had Walt Kelly Pogo paperbacks throughout the house. Mm-hmm. So uh, boy, I can remember, you know, like two, three years old, not being able to read, but just being fascinated by how those little characters were so alive on the page. So, uh, you know, somewhere in my brain is, you know, Walt Kelly's artwork and then you know i grew up in the 60s so uh you know peanuts was like the main reason i wanted to become a cartoonist 
but then in 69, there was a, a reproduction book of Crazy Cat, and boy, that blew my little kid's mind when I saw that <laughs> book, and Crazy Cat still blows my mind. But, um, you know, so I think, you know, you just look at stuff and get inspired by it, and that comes out in its own way. So I think, you know, uh, I mean, Seagar's pop. I'm just a big fan of all the old stuff, so I think it's kind of natural that my stuff would have a little of that in it. Well, what's interesting about it is that it has that um, older classic look of uh, uh, Crazy Cat, and you know, but it, it's got a very modern sensibility. I mean, it's you know, and, and not just because of the, the, the you know the, the shelter stories. I mean, it just it has that uh, you know. 21st century attitude, but it's it's in this uh, in the body of this uh, you know early 20th century style. Yeah, you know, and I mean I don't you know want it to be retro. I mean I, I think it's of today, but um, you know, I guess again just you know what you absorb. And for me, I was just a real big fan of that early stuff, and, and not even that I try to copy you know cross hatching or techniques. I think what I liked about it is just had a looser. Uh, more freeform feel to it and a really manic energy that I like <laughs> that, you know, somewhere in the fifties and sixties, things got really heavily designed and very sleek and that just never appealed to me. Mm-hmm. So you know, I think my work still has like a looseness of the early stuff, but at the same time, I'm not trying to make it look like it's from 1920 by any means. The, uh, the, uh, cartoonist interviews that I've done on Mr. Media, we tend to draw a lot of other cartoonists listening. So uh, tell, uh, tell, tell people who might be listening, if they were looking at your drawing table, what, what kind of supplies would they see? What, would, uh, you know, what, would, what might you be using that might be a little different than, oh, I don't know, that uh, Moore Walker might, might have at his table? Okay. <laughs> the first thing they'd probably notice is there's usually a cat sleeping on it. So uh, <laughs> my cat would be there more than likely. And, um, but as far as tools, uh, I mean, I, I use a fountain pen that I dip into a bottle of ink like a regular Crocro pen. I don't fill up the fountain pen. I actually use it as a dipping pen. And um, there'd be my FW ink, and uh, there'd be Strathmore Bristol board as the paper I use. And um, there'd be a little kids watercolor kit <laughs> to watercolor <laughs> really? my, yeah to watercolor my sundays nothing too fancy and uh you know some light pencils and some brushes nothing that's actually it's a pretty clean table it's just like you know it's a pretty uh you know i don't I mean, well you know on occasion i use the old zipatone stuff which i don't know if people even know what that is anymore but you know to get the gray dots i actually still cut zipatone and put it on There's varying uh, dot patterns right yeah yeah, well, actually, I only use one. So. Oh, okay. And that's um, pretty much everything. Now, is the cat a good partner at the desk, or has the cat <laughs> caused any problems over the years? You know, once, actually, I, I was just about done with the daily, and the ink wasn't dried yet, and her tail moved, and I literally watched the whole daily just become a big snow. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm, a little more, now I'm a little more careful about where she is. How long does it take you to produce a week's worth of strips? Uh, just dailies and then Sunday uh, on the side. You know, it's funny. If you would have asked me a year ago, I would have told you about four days. But I'm just in the last year, I've finally been managing <laughs> the strip a little easier, and I'm doing it a little faster. And uh, boy, that helps a lot. You know, I used to be <laughs> right. I used to be right on deadline, and now I'm like a week ahead, which for me is like amazing. Um, but I think I'm slowly getting the hang of this thing and doing it a little faster. You know, probably the nicest thing about becoming a cartoonist is I got to become good friends with Charles Schultz, my hero. And, um, you know, he was like 10 months ahead, six months ahead, and he knew I was right on the deadline. So, uh, you know, he used to tease me with, uh, you know, he'd call me in May and I'd be working on June strips, and then he'd call and the first thing out of his mouth would be, isn't it tough coming up with these Christmas holiday jokes? And Just to tease me. But now I'm, getting, now I'm a little faster. So when you ask how long does it take for me to do a week, um, you know, a couple of days, three days, maybe two days. What what made the difference? Practice, <laughs> practice. Oh, practice. practice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and no, I just think I'm a, a little, uh, yeah, a little more professional about it. I said they, uh, 
they come out a little easier. Is it the uh, is it the uh, uh, the gag that 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 would come slower? Or I'm guessing it was the gag as opposed to the artwork. The artwork. I mean, you seem to have that well in hand. But is the is is the gag the thing that would slow you down over the? Yeah, years? I mean, the writing always you know is the tough part for sure. But even in, you know even in the the uh, production of the strip, you know uh, you know just I'm, I, I letter a little faster and. I guess I can, I can, you know, I, I'm old fashioned. I do it the traditional way, which as far as number, you know, the Sunday page, I watercolor it and then every color gets a number. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm just a little, you know, I know the, the numbers of the colors so well and I had them. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the old comic strips and boy, the color. And, you know, if you look at a little Nemo or a gasoline hour, the color was unbelievable. So you know, it took me a while to figure out how to get the modern comics to try to copy those colors. So, you know, I took a while to, to number and color strip, but I'm definitely faster at that now because I have I really understand how the colors are going to come out. Hmm. Um, let me give out our number. Uh, I see that there's a few more people picking up in the web chat. There's a live web chat. It's uh, the company's a live Mr. Media interview. But if you've got a question for Patrick McDonald, creator of the Daily Comic Strip Mutts, please give us a call six four six five nine five three one three five we've got the uh, line open we'd be happy to take your call um, tell us a little bit about how you see uh, the lead, well the, the, the characters from uh, Mutz, uh, Mooch and Earl as individuals I mean what what defines them what sets them apart uh, well they're definitely different I mean I think you know that's kind of at the heart of the strip of you know you know natural enemies of a cat and dog become a good friend so um, you know, they definitely have their own ways about them and, uh, you know, heavily influenced by my own dog and cat. I mean, you know, Earl's is based on the uh, Jack Russell Terrier I had for 19 years. And um, so I think a lot of his personality, he was just such a, you know, always happy. And boy, I always say if I can capture any of his spirit and joy of life in my comic, I'm doing my job. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> the heart of the strip, I think, is just, you know, that the love of a dog, you know, I, I, everything is exciting and new to them. So that's Earl, and then you know, Mooch is a little more cat-like, you know, a little uh, his own way of thinking and doing things. Do they were they ever inspired by actual people that you've known? Well, you know, Earl more inspired by my actual dog, and okay. uh, you know, I think I think it's sort of what. Charles Schultz always said, I mean, it's just aspects of yourself, you know, I mean, I, I definitely have a Mooch character in me, and I definitely have an Earl character in me, and uh, yeah, I definitely have a Krabby character in me, too, <laughs> so, you know, it really all comes from yourself, you know, so uh, I would say the only characters that are kind of based, I mean, Frank and Millie, Mooch's uh, owners, um, are kind of based on my mom and dad, they don't look like my mom and dad, but my mom was a cat lover, and my dad couldn't care less. So that that <laughs> is kind of uh, a little bit like my own mom and dad. Um, I'm curious about what you were, you just said a second ago about uh, uh, that there's a little bit of you in each of us. I remember talking to Stefan Pastis, and he was saying that he was more like Rat uh, than any of his other characters. And so, you know, when that, that crankiness comes out, <laughs> that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I can say that that's you know that's where it all comes from. Do you uh, uh, do you have much contact with other uh, with other uh, creators? You know, not all, not all that much. I mean, I I go to all the you know the National Cartoonist Society get together every year for the Rubin Awards, and I think I've only missed one since I've been a member. So I I definitely get to meet everyone there, mm -hmm. and. Um, there's a few people I'll talk to once in a while, but not, I mean, not, not anything daily or, you know, not too often. You know, it's, it's no, a weird it's, job. I mean, you know, you kind of uh, isolate it and there's so much work to do. You kind of work most of the time. And when you get out, you get to see people. Hmm. Um, um, sorry, lost my, lost my train of thought for a second. Um, when uh, when when South uh, Unit Children's book came out in uh, October, 
uh, it, it made me laugh. I've got this, this strip uh, here in front of me, actually. Uh, it, it was funny because you, uh, you actually snuck kind of a subtle plug for the book into the daily strip. Um, I, I, to be honest, what I wondered is, it, was that at all effective? Was it just for fun or you know, did it actually uh, help you with sales? Oh, you know, I don't, they don't track sales. <laughs> At least I don't. I don't know if they track sales that that detailed. Where I would know if I mentioned Mutt's, um if it actually helps sales. You know, I, I kind of did a little traditional thing. But after every book on the you know the Sunday panels, the opening uh, title panel and the Sunday pages is kind of. I always do little tributes to different things. So whenever a new book right. comes out, I always do the the cover of the book. But I don't know if it helps sales or not. Just to me, it's just a little way of kind of celebrating the book. It was fun because the, um, you've got the the characters are uh, talking about uh, writing a postcard uh, to the birds, <laughs> which of course is the subject of the book. Uh, I like that. Um, we've got a question for you from the uh, web chat. We 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 sort of touched on this a little, but uh, I'll go back to it. Uh, My life in a cube dot com asked. Uh, you are mainly a newspaper cartoonist. Do you have any thoughts on the fall of your medium? <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, subtle question. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely uh, not doing all that great. Um, you know, I think, I mean, comics in some form will always be around. So, uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to morph into something else. I, you know, I think, you know, words and pictures and telling stories is just, part of who we are so if, you know if the newspapers disappear it'll you know it'll pop up somewhere else and like i said i mean i hopefully books aren't going to go away too soon so uh you know i always feel like i can just do books books nobody reads anymore <laughs> <laughs> um what about a uh and, and uh, for people who are just joining us uh we uh, when we started the conversation you mentioned uh that uh, there is some talk of uh an animated mutts and that you're also uh Looking at uh, some graphic novel type projects, um, uh, would uh, yeah, how well how far along is is any animation conversation? Is, are the rights held now by a studio? No, no. I um, you know I've, I've talked to a few people over the years. No, the main thing is I've been kind of working on a script and a, an idea for a movie and I feel like I'm getting closer to something I would like to see get done. So um, it's more me putting the product together and then going to sell it. But um, so that's where I'm at with that. And just me being more aggressive in doing that, I've been kind of holding back for a while. Hmm. Do you, uh, you know, uh, are you concerned at all about giving up some of the uh, uh, creative control if you if you go to yeah, a movie? Well, that's or... the main thing, and that's, that's why I'm trying to have as clear an idea of how I see it before I go into it because, you know, Hollywood has a tendency to take something and make it something else. So that's why I've been approaching it slow and making sure I work with the right people and have the right script to go ahead forward because uh, I mean, the only reason I'd want to do it is just, you know, I would want it to have the same tone and feel as much. And uh, you know, that kind of goes a little against the grain with most animations that are being done today. So, you know, I just want to approach it carefully. Would you be able to give up control if it if it came to that? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I think part of that is getting the right people that you trust. I think that's a big part of it. Mm. You know, so I mean, like, obviously, I'd want to. I mean, I'm, I totally understand, especially when you do a daily comic strip. I, you know, I can't do everything, so I definitely would want to be a part of it. But I think it's surrounding yourself with people who understand the vision and you can trust. And you know, I, actually, I'm. You know, I think that's part of it that that could be fun. I mean, I'm, my work is so solo. It would be nice to, uh, you know, to uh, work with other people. Hmm. You mentioned uh, that you had been out to Pixar. What uh, what prompted that? Do you know somebody out there, or was it a, a business? Yeah, I'm, I'm friends with Pete Doctor, who is the director of Monsters Inc. Oh, and, uh, I was out in San Francisco. Actually, I was, I, well, I was out in San Francisco. I'm on I'm on the board of directors of the Schiltz Museum in Santa Rosa. So we had our uh, Schultz, Schultz, yeah, I think I've heard of that guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great museum. I recommend it to all your listeners if you're ever out in Santa Rosa. It's really <laughs> beautiful. They did such a great job of uh, honoring them, and you really get a, a great feel for the strip and the guy at the museum. So I'm, I'm on their board, and they had their fall meeting, so I was out there for that. And while I was out there, I uh, visited Pixar. 
Hmm. That must have been a pretty interesting experience. It's not something that the average person gets to see. Yeah, no, Pixar is great. <laughs> really, <laughs> one place you know, if I if I was, I never thought about having a real job, but um, and I don't know if you can call working at Pixar a real job, but uh, that would be a great <laughs> place to work. If you had to go to an office, that's the office you want to go to. Oh, I would think so. Um, the uh, the shelter stories in Mutz have become, you know, as uh, expected, uh, I think, uh, a part of the strip as, well, we mentioned Schultz, as, as Schultz just to send Snoopy to reminisce with war veterans. Um, how did you get so involved? How did, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, at what point did you go from being a guy who does a strip about dogs and cats, and pet, you know, pet animals, to a guy who's got this involvement in the Humane Society and this commitment that, you know, goes a little beyond just getting its strip out every day. You know, it was a real natural uh, evolution because, uh, you know, the thing with Mutz, when I when I started Mutz, you know, I really wanted the animals, uh, Earl and Mooch, to be as animal-like as possible. And, I mean, obviously they talk and aren't real animals, but I wanted the tone in the field of the strip to really be that they were like your pets so people could identify them with them. I, you know, I really didn't want them just to be animal characters, but they go, you know, they do human things, you know, they're on the computer all day or, the, you know, they have jobs. I mean, I really wanted them to be animal-like. And so with Mutz, you know, part of what I do is try to see the world from their eyes. I mean, I'm always looking at my cat and dog or other animals and trying to think, you know, what do they think and, you know, try to have empathy for their lives. And um, I think in doing this trip for a while, you know, it made me think about all the dogs and cats that are sitting in shelters and don't have the great lives that Earl and Mooch have. So, you know, it kind of became important to me is how could I tell that story about, you know, the Earl and Mooches that are, you know, in cages waiting for a home. And uh, I started fooling around with some ideas in my sketchbook. And this was, I think, in 96. And I actually got contacted by the Humane Society of the United States to let me know that in November they have a National Animal Appreciation, Animal Shelter Appreciation Week. And I thought, wow. And they were asking if there's any way I can promote that. And I was thinking, wow, it's a perfect place and time to, to do these shelter stories I was writing. So, uh, you know, I did it, and I, they were really well received. And I now I do it twice a year. I do it the first week in May and the work, first week in November. But, uh, you know, again, in, in doing the strip from the animal's point of view, uh, I think, Animal issues became a natural part of the trip. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you still, I mean, you, you, you kind of leap from that to, you know, being on the board of uh, the uh, the National Humane Society. I mean, not a small commitment, I'm assuming. <laughs> no, not not for a cartoonist. No, <laughs> not for anybody. <laughs> but uh, you, and, you know, that that was kind of a surprise. You know, I started talking to them, you know, mostly about mud stuff and how I could help and. Uh, they actually asked me if I wanted to be on the board, which was kind of shocking to me. But um, uh, you know, I fear I couldn't pass up that opportunity. I'm really glad I did. I think it's a really important, big part of my life now. But you know, to actually try to help animals, you know, are not only just through my strip, but you know, in a, in a real, you know, real helpful level. I mean, the Humane Society with Wayne Paselli, the new CEO, is just doing amazing stuff. I mean, I, they just helped pass Prop 2 in California. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that was a real great accomplishment that just happened this last election. Mm-hmm. So I'm really proud to be part of that, and uh, you know, I feel good for the animals. I think you know they have a great team that's working for them. Um, let me get out our phone number again. Uh, if you've uh, got a question for Patrick McDonald, the creator of the daily comic strip Mutz. Give us a call, 646-595-3135. We're going to go oh, another 15 to 20 minutes here, so don't wait until the last minute. If you got a, if you got a question, get up the nerve now, give us a call. Uh, one of the two new books, we talked about South a bit, but you've also got uh, Mutz uh, Shelter Stories. Um, I, I hate to go out and out plug, but if you'd like to tell people about this book and you know how this might uh, benefit uh, uh, the Humane Society. I'd be happy to let you do that right now. <laughs> well, you know, the shelter stories. You know, I've been doing those strips uh, for over ten years now, so there was finally enough to do a whole book of them. And what's kind of nice about the book, it's not only my strips about the animals in the shelters and the people who take care of them, but uh, on our website, we asked, um, and on the Humane Society website, we asked people to send in photos and stories of their own 
cats and dogs and birds and ferrets that they uh, rescued from a shelter. And so it's a combination of my comics and then real, you know, real photos and real stories of uh, animals from the point of, you know, from their owner's point of view. And um, so it's a nice combination of uh, cartoons, cartoon stories and real stories. And uh, and then in the, the back of the book, there's a, a guide um, to help people to uh, how they can go get their new best friend at their local shelter, you know, what to look for and what to expect in different avenues to help you do that. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the book, and I, I honestly I didn't see this, so I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, honestly, but uh, do uh, the do, uh, portion of sales from the book go to the Humane Society? Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> That long um, silence made me feel yeah. very guilty asking you that question. I'm sorry, Badger. Okay, we'll move on. Sure. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, we uh, uh, The first time we spoke uh, was several years ago. Uh, I had interviewed you for uh, my biography of Will Eisner. And uh, at the time, I found out that you and uh, Ray Billingsley – uh, who's also in the book, uh, Ray created uh, Curtis, uh, that you were in uh, one of Eisner's classes together, I think in 75, at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. And uh, now, I could tell people that they should go read that book, but I'll, I'll, I'll save them a buck here. Um, tell us what you remember from uh, Eisner's class and any impact that that may have had. Oh, no, that, that was great. I mean, to be taught by, you know, one of the greatest comic book artists ever was just a real honor. And, uh, what was kind of exciting was that, you know, at that time, uh, Warner magaz- Warren magazines were reprinting the Spirit, you know, comics. So, uh, you know, I was reading them and, you know, going nuts thinking how great they were and then, you know, was able to have them as a teacher. So that was like a real honor and thrill. And he was just the nicest guy. I mean, um, you know, what was, what was really smart and fun was, uh, you know, every class he would, at the end of the year, we actually produced our own comic. You know, we all got like three or four pages in black and white. So um, that's one of my first published pieces was to be in, you know, Will Eisner's gallery comic book. Um, so, you know, not only did you get, you know, his teaching on how to tell a story, you actually saw it printed at the end of the year. So that was just, you know, a really treat that he gave everybody in the class. I mean, that was like, I think we were all very excited to actually work on a real magazine you know so uh yeah he was and i hope the other thing i remember was he always i guess you know as a who he was he was always getting free stuff in the mail and he would bring in boxes of books that he got for us to go through and i boy i remember getting some great crazy cat reproduction books from i think it was sweden or denmark that you couldn't mm-hmm. get anywhere else so uh, it was uh, a really fun class I think I remember in the in the in the biography writing that you you said something about how your eyes lit up when you saw that. It was just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, you know, I, I still have them on my shelf. And uh, and boy, you know, it's funny. God, I don't know how many. Let me think. How many years later? Maybe twenty uh, something years later. Will and I were both up for the uh, Rubin Award at the National Cartoonist Society. It was in '98, uh, I think. Yeah, and of, and of course he won. But uh, I went up to him afterwards, and I told him uh, if he, you know, if he was a better teacher, I would have won. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> him. But uh, yeah, no, Will Eisner's great. And um, geez, I just saw in the bookstore they have a pop-up Will Eisner spirit book. Have you seen that? I saw that. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah, it's it's really you know it's it's funny. I mean, it it was a nice way to tell the story. So uh, yeah, so that's just still exciting stuff. I'm not sure how what the movie's going to be like, but uh, you know, his work is great. Do you have high, do you have any hopes for the movie? I uh, it's just us talking, right? Nobody's listening. Yeah, no one's listening. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I I I, I kind of wish that uh, uh, Miller had called it something else uh, because <laughs> I don't, you know I, I noticed it, it was originally the title was Will Eisner's The Spirit. That was the name of the movie, and I, I've noticed they've moved away from that in the last few months. That it just seems to be The Spirit, which that's good because I think anybody who ever read The Spirit or or, or new will, we'll, we'll look at that movie and go, well, that's not Will Eisner's spirit. <laughs> Which, you know, we, you know, we come full circle. It goes back to me in animation because Hollywood has a tendency to do that. 
that's got to be hard. That's, and, that's, and that's, you know, I was asking you about, you know, giving up uh, uh, con- creative control. I, uh, I spent a lot of time with Will the, the last three years of his life, and uh, I, I think that it, his favorite part about uh, the movie's interest in the spirit was uh, collecting that, uh, that annual check for the rights. And his least favorite part was when they actually got close to making a movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, I, uh, I know there's a lot of uh, mythology now about his relationship with, uh, with Frank Miller. Uh, they were not the closest uh, at the end, and I, I don't know that he would have wanted Frank or anyone else, frankly, uh, to make the movie, certainly while he was alive. And his feeling was, once he was gone, well, you know, it, 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 helped, it helped his estate. He'd take care of his wife and, and family, and, you know, so be it. But I don't think it's going to look anything like uh, the spirit. I, I think we'd all be better served if they called it something else. And, you know, uh, any, anyway, I'm, I'm getting off track here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and I, I want to point out that while you and Will uh, were on the uh, – uh, both nominated the same year in 98, and he did win. You did come back and win it in 99. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and I know Will was uh, very proud of you. I know he was proud of uh, Ray Billingsley and uh, so many of the guys uh, who, you know, came through there and uh, dealt with him over the years. Um, what, was the, uh, what was the worst advice that any art teacher ever gave you over the years? Jeez, whatever it was, I forgot it. <laughs> I don't pay attention to bad advice, so I couldn't tell you. That's pretty good. I like that answer. I'm going to try to remember that if anyone ever asked me to meet you. Um, well, let me ask you this. Uh, well, maybe it won't apply so much. I was going to ask you what the best and worst advice that any other comics professional had offered you, either you know before you really got into it or, or you know since. Well, you know what no one did tell me, and I wish they would have, <laughs> and I tell this to new cartoonists all the time, but you know, it, the, you know the, when you really think about it, I mean, the craziness of a daily deadline is a, a really crazy way to make art. Hmm. And, um, you know, when you sell your strip, there's usually a, a period of at least six months and sometimes even longer before your strip actually hits the newspaper. You know, you're in the development stage of, like, working it out and doing the strips. And, uh, boy, the secret for a daily comic strip artist is during that six-month or a year period to do as many darn strips as you possibly can because that's your only time to get ahead pretty much. Mm-hmm. So um, if any young cartoonist just sold a strip, my advice is to work like crazy those first ten months before your strip's actually in the paper because, you know, if you can start a strip where you're six months ahead, you know, life eventually eats away at that six months, but at least, you know, you'll be in a better place down the future. So uh, mm. instead of telling you what advice I got, I just gave some advice to any daily cartoonist who's starting up. Sounds like uh, I used to cover uh, pop music back in the 80s, and I remember talking to, uh, oh, I wish I could remember who it was. It was somebody who had been around maybe 10 years and had done some records, and I asked them something similar, and the guy said, uh, you know, you have your whole life to produce your first album. And it comes out, and if you're lucky, it, it takes off and it does well. And then six months later, they think you can produce another one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it's just, you know, it's very, very, very difficult to do that. Um, you know, it, let's kind of wind up with this. Uh, we've talked a little bit on and off about uh, the changes in the, uh, in the newspaper world and the strip world. It wasn't that long ago. Um, I remember, uh, I think I talked to Mark Tatuli, who does Leo and Heart yeah. of the City. Um, and I, we were talking about this big debate in the comics world uh, about whether it was time for heritage strips, whether they be High and Lois, Beetle Bailey, Blondie, and I'm just picking out a couple. I don't mean to pick on them in particular, but then maybe it was time for them to retire and, and make room for a new generation, you know, yours and, um, you know, Get Fuzzy and Leo and, and uh, Pearls Before Swine, things like that. Um, it seems like the cuts at the newspapers are rendering that issue moot. Am I wrong? Yeah, it seems. I mean, a lot of those old strips that seem you know untouchable are now disappearing from the papers. So that actually is happening to a certain extent. Did, did you have a view on that up until it, 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 it was rendered moot? I mean, uh, and it, what's interesting in asking you about this is that you know your I mean your work has an older feel to it. It has a more mature 
feel to it. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's kind of curious if, if you felt that was a, if, if it was fair to expect some of them to slide over or, or unfair. Well, you know, um, I mean, I think some of them, and I'm not going to name names, you know, still hold up as decent strips and then others don't. So to me, it's just, you know, I guess it's based on how well they're done and some probably should go. And again, I won't name names, but uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not against it if there's still, you know, I think, you know, what's great about some of the old characters is that they really were just great characters that have lived for that long. So I'm not totally against it as long as they're still done well. And I think some of them are. I think it just comes down to, uh, you know, if they're still worth doing or not. You're with a syndicate, uh, King, that is, I mean, it's a real, it's a heritage company. It's got a lot of the older strips, that some of which, you know, I mean, them dis, no disrespect, but some of them have been carried on because they, they have a value or potential value. Uh, you know, as in other fields, whether they make a movie of Flash Gordon or something like that. Uh, but the flip side of that is, uh, has King uh, had a, a, an approach to current creators and said, okay, we know that the industry is hurting. These are some of the things that we're talking about. This is where we, we think your work is going to go in, in five years or ten years. This is, you know, how we're going to protect our investment in you. You're going to have to give me that question again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I guess what I'm wondering is, is, is King, uh, and, and I think of them because they, they're a company that have a lot of heritage strips and, and, and creations. Have they, have they approached their, their creators, people like yourself, um, uh, and said, listen, we know that the, in, the newspaper industry is hurting. You're not growing like you would have five or ten years ago. Here's where we think this is all going to go in five or ten years. Here's how we're going to protect our investment in you. Well, you know, I, I mean, I think you know, King, I mean, I can't speak for King, but I think they're definitely looking at the future. But um, I think one of the things I like about my syndicate is they kind of let the artists do what the artists do. So, uh, you know, no one's asked me to do anything differently, that's for sure. <laughs> and I think, right. you know, King, even though they have the old the old classic strips being the first comic syndicate there ever was, but I, I think they're very aggressive with coming up with new things, too. I mean, you know, my good friend Jay Kennedy, who picked Mutt's, you know, was uh, very uh, forward thinking, and uh, you know, Brendan Bruford's there now, and uh, you know, Brendan's just great. I mean, his knowledge of you know underground stuff and graphic stuff. I mean, I need he's a comic artist himself, so uh, you know, even though there's an old history, I can't. I think they're really forward thinking in uh, the new stuff too. Mm. You know, I just uh, Patrick, before you go, I, I just noticed that I, I missed a question here from the uh, web chat. Uh, mylifeinacube.com, who asked us uh, uh, something earlier, wanted to know what your proudest moment as a cartoonist is, and I'm going to let him get the last word in there. Proudest moment? Um, I guess there's a few. I mean, it would be silly not to say uh, actually getting the Rubens Award in 1999. Um, you know, again, being a, a, a fan of the history of the comic strip and just knowing all the past winners of that award and boy the award itself which if you ever seen one in person you know was designed by